Hi, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist and welcome to another COVID-19 debunking video, which is a continuation in this saga of people saying dumb things at public hearings. Worse than any TikTok trend, this seems to be the popular thing to do for anti-vaxxers and COVID deniers these days. And in this video, I'm going to be covering a Fred Corbin who decided to get up at a public hearing in Barbados to talk about his thoughts on COVID-19. And hold on, because it gets real dumb real fast. Let's get into it. I'd like to ask the Chief Medical Officer, please, to provide evidence for the public education that describes the isolation of a SARS-CoV-2 virus directly from a sample taken from a deceased patient, where the patient sample was not first combined with any other source of genetic material, i.e. monkey kidney cells, aka viral cells, liver cancer cells. So right off the bat, he's going full-blown conspiracy here, suggesting that SARS-CoV-2 has never been isolated. <sighs> if you've been following my channel, you know I've covered this topic before. I've even gone as far as my friends and I confronting people who claim that SARS-CoV-2 is not a virus and that it doesn't exist in their own webinars, and that was hilarious. And with what Fred Corbin is saying here, it's really no different. He is designing a question to get the specific answer he wants. He wants SARS-CoV-2 that hasn't been mixed with any cells, but you need cells in order to propagate virus. Viruses need hosts. That's one of the hallmarks of viruses. But in response to anybody who says anything like this, I just like to show them pictures like this, which are high resolution images of SARS-CoV-2 virus that has been purified and imaged in high enough resolution to see the amino acid side chains on the spike protein itself. And when we compare the sequence of these amino acids to what we expect from the measured genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it matches. So there you go, Fred Corbin. There is proof that SARS-CoV-2 exists and has been isolated and purified. A lot of people believe that the SARS-CoV-2 is a novel coronavirus. SARS-CoV-2 is a subclade of the beta coronavirus family. Well, SARS-CoV-2 is not itself a clade, but it belongs to the family of coronaviruses. Yeah, no one disputes that. And how do we know this? Simply because we did cross-referencing via the International Taxometer Reviews, and then correlated those with actual genetic sequences, and reviewed them against the patent records that were available, and it is apparent that the declaration of a novel coronavirus is a fallacy. Is he really saying that because it's part of a family of viruses that it's not new? Oh my god. New viruses can emerge within existing families of viruses. Why is this a hard concept? First vaccine patent for coronavirus was sought by Pfizer, and more specifically, the patenting of the S spike protein. The same thing we've allegedly only just discovered. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> um, no. So coronaviruses have spike protein. We didn't just discover spike protein when SARS-CoV-2 emerged, but SARS-CoV-2's spike protein is unique. I mean, seriously, this is a huge lack of understanding on his part. It's a new coronavirus. It's going to have features of previous coronaviruses, but as a whole, it is a new virus. <sighs> First patent application was filed January 28, 2000. 21 years ago. There is nothing new about this. Okay, so he's also bringing up patents here to try and make his point, which doesn't make any sense, but let me address what people are mostly saying about SARS-CoV-2 patents that they're getting wrong. So there are patents concerning coronaviruses that go back a few decades, mostly having to do with the original SARS-1 virus that emerged in 2002-2003. Back then, it was legal to patent naturally occurring sequences. So if you found a virus out in the wild, like SARS-1, you could patent it. But that all changed in the US in 2013, when a high-profile court case against Myriad Genetics went to the Supreme Court and it was decided that naturally occurring sequences cannot be patented. 
That's why you can find patents for SARS coronavirus back in the day, but you won't find SARS-CoV-2 patents for the virus itself. What you will find today are patents having to do with SARS-CoV-2 that include modified sequences. For example, if you want to take a snippet of the SARS-CoV-2 genome and use that as a tool in a molecular test like a PCR, then you can patent that. None of this says anything about how new SARS-CoV-2 is. This guy is just seriously misguided. No one has ever produced a safe and effective vaccine against a coronavirus. It has never been done, and it never will be done, simply because it's not possible. Incorrect. There have been several vaccines for SARS-1 that, by all tests and measures, were safe and effective, but they did not move forward to clinical trials and eventual approval because there was no motivation to make a vaccine for a virus that was no longer an issue. And today we have very safe and effective vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. This safety and efficacy has been demonstrated across countries, across labs, across independent researchers. They're safe. They're effective. It's been done. General method of action for infectivity and pathogenicity, in other words, this is what makes it so deadly, okay, of SARS-CoV-2 appears to be specifically related to cumulative charge resulting from inserts placed on the surface of the spike receptor binding domain. What does that tell you? This is a lab engineered phenomenon. Oh boy, no. Insert is a term we use in genetics for a piece of DNA that literally gets inserted at a specific location relative to a reference strand. There are several naturally occurring mechanisms that can create inserts within a genome. Nothing about it has to be engineered. This document where it says two mutations were critical for back to human transmission of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. We recognized HKU4 spike aiming to build its capacity to mediate viral entry into human cells. To this end, we introduced two single mutations. We introduced two single mutations, not the we. Oh my god. Okay, no, so I found the paper he's talking about here, and here's what they were doing. The researchers in this study were trying to understand why the spike protein belonging to the coronavirus that causes MERS, or Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, can infect human cells. So they had the sequence for the spike protein from the MERS coronavirus, and they had the sequence for the spike protein from another coronavirus that couldn't infect human cells. They compared these two sequences and observed what was different. They then identified mutations that were unique to the MERS spike protein, but not found in the other coronavirus's spike protein. These were mutations that were candidates for actually granting the MERS spike protein its ability to infect human cells. They then made those mutations in the other coronavirus's spike gene and found that it does allow them to infect human cells. These are experiments to understand and characterize what is out there. We are not making anything new in the lab. We are understanding what already exists in nature. So why is Fred bringing up this paper that has nothing to do with SARS-CoV-2 in this hearing? Well, because he doesn't understand any of it, and he's trying to sound as scary as possible. And this is very, very critical, because it outlines the chemical and the biological processes which were very, very carefully manipulated in order to be able to produce an mRNA that also contain a very, very dangerous toxin to the human body. Do you know what that toxin is? That toxin is called graphene oxide. Oh my god. Ah, <sighs> yep. Graphene oxide. This guy's just playing conspiracy pinball at this point, bouncing back and forth between whatever crazy idea has ever come across his Facebook feed at one point or another. No, there is no graphene oxide in any COVID vaccine or any vaccine that is on the market, for that matter. The contents of vaccines have to be tested by third parties, not just by the company that makes them. If there was any graphene oxide in those vaccines, we would know about it. But there isn't, and why would there be? What 
on earth would anyone have to gain from adding graphene oxide to COVID vaccines and keeping it a secret? Now let me tell you how graphene oxide works when it gets into the body. Because when the spike protein then binds itself to our blood cells and so on, graphene oxide then starts to build a structure. Not only did that make zero scientific sense, but I could see him trying to make up these lies on the spot. He's just trying to pull anything he can out of the air and say it in this hearing to scare all the audience members. And I really feel the energy that this lady is giving off right now. She is just over this guy. The patent databases that we have accessed proves that COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccines are in fact a bioweapon. And how do we support that? Because we have a copy of the mysteriously deleted Wuhan databases that tell us everything. Right. You know, I also have access to those mysteriously deleted sequences too. Everyone does. They're published in a free-to-read paper. Yeah, I can only assume he's talking about those deleted sequences that were in the news a while ago. It got a lot of attention because some actual scientists thought that it was a big deal. But if you look into it, it's really not. The reasons are so mundane, it's almost not worth covering. So in June of 2020, some Chinese researchers published a paper that contained some SARS-CoV-2 sequences. Now, whenever you publish biological sequences, the journal normally asks you to submit those sequences to an online database. Well, in this case, after the publication, the Chinese researchers asked the database that they submitted to to delete their sequences. Why? because they had moved their sequences to another website, one that for them was easier to access and easier for them to update their data. That's literally all that happened. And it's not ideal, but this happens a lot in biology. It's not nefarious, it's not weird, and if you want to know what the sequences were, they're in the paper that was published. You can see all the mutations that they detected in this sequence relative to the original strain. It teaches us really nothing new. But instead of Fred Corbin pulling out this undeniable proof that SARS-CoV-2 is a bioweapon, he waits until his last few sentences in this hearing to claim that he has undeniable proof. This is the quality of information that goes viral in anti-vaccine and COVID denier circles. It's ridiculous and lacks even the most basic understanding of molecular biology. Well, that was a particularly wacky one. I hope I'm done with this public hearing saga for now because it's getting more and more ridiculous. As always, the links to all of the science that I talk about in this video are posted in the description below so that you can check them out for yourself. Also, don't forget that in the description, I have a link to the American Society for Virology town hall meetings. These are public meetings where you'll actually learn something. They're free Zoom meetings held by virologists so that you can ask them whatever questions you have about viruses and vaccines. Thanks so much for watching, I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe so that you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.